The music stopped. That must be my cue. Good morning. morning. Welcome to summer worship at our Savior's today. As we continue our journey through the book of Acts, the worship today it will take on sort of a, it sort of has a classic feel to it, but the traditional liturgy pieces will be replaced by good old-fashioned favorite hymns. So uh, that we'll be trying to do that a couple of times this summer. So uh, we're we'll replacing the hymn of praise with a good old-fashioned hymn and the, the uh, great thanksgiving of, during the um, pre-communion part. That'll be replaced by a good old-fashioned hymn as well. I'm glad you're here. Together we worship, together we share, together we pray, together we serve. And it's better when you are here. In person or on the radio or watching on Cat 7 or a few days later if you catch us on YouTube. If you're not here on a Sunday morning and you want to catch up with what happened, and this is actually going to be a good thing because as we're reading through the book of Acts as sort of a series thing, it, it might be helpful for you to sort of get caught up. You know, you can skip all the boring singing part and then go straight to the most important part, my sermon. No, it's all important. It's all good. It's all good. But connect with each other. If you're here this morning, use the little brown books to get to know one another. Or if you're not here in person, like us on Facebook or give us a call or stop by at the office anytime during the week. It's good to be together so that um, our ministry staff can be connected with you and that we can stay connected with each other. So welcome this morning. The Holy Spirit moved mightily in the lives of Jesus' followers as the early church took shape. That's what we're looking at in the book of Acts, those very early days of the church and the beginnings of that. So we'll hear about that today, but that same Spirit is at work today in this very space, in this very time, in this very room. So let that Holy Spirit gather us in. Would you rise together with me as we sing 532, Gather Us In. The words will be on the screen.
We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As they called an ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of praise, all hail the power of Jesus' name. 634 for the music.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join with me in the prayer of the day. O oh God, throughout the ages, you judge your people with mercy, and you inspire us to speak your truth. By your Spirit, anoint us for lives of faith and service, and bring all people into your forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The lesson today is from Psalm 32. Please read responsively. The assembly's portion is in bold print. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Linda. So we're journeying through the book of Acts. The psalm each Sunday serves as a, an echo point of the lesson that we'll hear, the reading that we'll hear, the story that we will hear from the book of Acts. But the story so far, in the beginning, the earth was formless and void. I don't know, maybe I don't need to go all the way back to creation with this. That was a laugh line, by the way. Good morning. Just checking, making sure you're awake. All right, so since the beginning of creation, though, God has been working. He's been at work in the lives of all the people of the world, I believe, not just the special few. God has been at work in the lives of all God's people, trying to work love into every person's equation. Trying to work the reality of love, not just some sort of some distant sort of, oh, love, but love into everybody's life. To be a life-giving and life-sharing relationship with God, that that would be a part of everybody's experience, every creature. Now, a specific group of humans were chosen to be the announcers of that love, to be the demonstrators of that love, not the sole proprietors of it. It gets so easy for religious people to go, oh, well, God loves us. And then that's about as far as it goes. It gets, and all religions are like this. Whatever truth of God's love there is in any religion or in any denomination, even in Christianity, every piece of it, we get so caught up in, well, we got it right. Huh? The rest of you, huh, good luck, but we got it right. God has always been in the business of trying to come into the lives of God's people, of everybody in the, in, in the cosmos. If there's, if there's planets out there in the world, um, out there in the, in the, in the universe with, with human life like, I think God is there too. 
pump and love into the, into the lives of God's people. So we're not supposed to be the sole proprietors of it, but we're supposed to be the demonstrators of it. And the Bible is full of the stories of God's people, of that spe- and particularly our Bible is full of the story of that particular group of people who were set aside to be the demonstrators, to be the ones who explained this love to everybody. Too often the story in Scripture is of how they failed. I mean, you read it. And again and again and again, it's God's people missing the boat. It's God's people holding it in close. It's God's people setting up rules and regulations so that those out there can't get in again and again. But even in the failure, God kept saying, let me help you with this, and would send the word. He would send prophets. He would send signs in heaven and and earth. God would get involved in the lives of God's people going, wait a minute now, let me help you with this. It's about love, so let me in. Let me love you. Let me live love through you. Let me do this. And too often... That offer on the part of God is met with stubborn rejection. They got distracted by many things, including their own God shaped religion and the laws of it. In order to be a true follower of of Yahweh, you must only eat this, you must only drink this, you must wash your clothes like that. I mean, just rule after rule after rule. And it was God-given, but it, but it got mangled and messed, and the love of it got, got lost. And so Jesus, the story so far, Jesus, virgin-born, teaching, healing, and of deep significance, fulfilling the law, all that was so important to God's people. Yes, Jesus came and said, yeah, I'm, I'm fulfilling the law, every piece of it, every part of it. This is, how it's, this is what it's supposed to look like. And Jesus lived it. And people's lives were changed and touched and, 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 and energized every, every time Jesus came along. His death, his resurrection to cover the ancient law, the resurrection to make it plain that Jesus was coming, that we're going to start this over. This God's love thing, this new creation, again and again, the language that Jesus used, this is a new creation, we're starting over, it's beginning again, let's start this over again. Wait a minute, let's, what are we doing? Oh, we're starting over again, and the, Pente- the Pentecost story where the Holy Spirit comes rushing down into the very heart of God's people to make it clean, clean and clearly plain, we're starting fresh. We're starting again. And in that Pentecost, the power for us to make that new start. And then, so then these formerly confused and struggling disciples are marvelously open to the power of God to work through them and spread this good news of Jesus to bring God's healing power to bear into the lives of more and more people to save them as we talked about last week. And 3,000 people one day on Pentecost Day, 3,000 people join up. The ushers, you were counting already how many people are here. 140. So take 140, you multiply it by 2 plus a little more, and then you multiply it by 10. So yes, a lot more people than are in this room. Boom, 3,000 people on one day. And more and more each day, we heard from the book of Acts last week, more and more each day, and there were healings and amazing things happened, like the one that we're going to read about today in in Acts chapters 3. And this new community is living lives of confidence and commitment and communication and cooperation and camaraderie and compassion and worshiping daily in the temple. And one of those days, one of those days, Acts chapter 3. So Peter and John are on their way to the temple. I'm going to kind of read this and kind of tell it because it's, but anyway, you'll see. So Peter and John are on the way to, on the, way to the temple to, to get there in time for one of the, one of the prayer times, the three o'clock in the afternoon prayer time. It's part of the law, but they were doing it because they loved doing it. 
you know. They came to worship. They were gathering together. Three, and those 3,000 people that were out in the city that had changed their lives for, for Jesus, that had, came, that had come to Jesus and, and repented, they were, they were showing up. Can you imagine if, you know, we were, I was preaching out in the streets and convinced, you know, twice this many people to start showing up on Sundays, how excited it would be in this place if a whole bunch of people we'd never seen before were showing up to worship every, you know, every time? Just, would, would that be awesome? Yeah. Get out there. Go get them. Anyway, so anyway, they're on their way in for the 3 o'clock prayer hour. And they come to the beautiful gate, as it is called, a gate to the temple. And there was this man who had been lame all his life. Every day he was carried to that gate to beg for money from the, for money from the people who were going into the temple. And he saw Peter and John going in, and he begged them to give him something. And they looked straight at him. And Peter said, look at us. So he looked at them, expecting to get something from them. I'm going to pause here because this is an important, an important part of the story. It's an important part of the story. How often do we see but not see the pain in the world around us? How easy is it for us to, to, to look at the, that the neighbor that you know is, is struggling and sort of the glance and, oh, hi, how you doing, and not really, not really want to know how they're doing? How often do we walk by, oh, it's just another one of those Native Americans. Oh, it's just another one of those veterans. Oh, it's just another one of those eccentric white folk. Oh, it's just another one of those people that have a little bit of struggle with their mental, or it's just another one of those people who, or it's just another one of those people who, or it's just, how easy is it for us to walk through somebody else's pain and not see it? We're wired differently. We're created to use religious language, and to, but we're wired, we're created to be caring, we're created to be able to see people's pain and interact with it and do something about it. That's the way we're made. And we figured out all kinds of amazing ways to sort of shield ourselves. Maybe, and maybe some of them are good and necessary and helpful for our own lives, but it's just, it doesn't help. We were created to see each other's pain. We were created to enter into each other's pain. That's exactly what Jesus came and showed us. And I think this, this moment in this story, and it's interesting that the, the, the book of Acts, as it tells the story of, of, of the beginnings of the church, says, oh, there were miracles and healings. But this is the first one it describes. Maybe this is the first one. Maybe this is where the miracles of healing begin in the new church. As Peter and John walk, and maybe they've walked by this guy. He's been here all of his life. Later on in the, in the book of Acts, he's 40 years old. His whole life, somebody has had to drag him to the beautiful gate. Interesting little thing with the language there. Beautiful. What makes something beautiful? What makes something worthy of our attention? Why do we look at things? What, what, as we see them, what makes it beautiful? He's sitting outside the beautiful gate his whole life long. Peter and John have been going in and out of that gate for months. He's been begging there. And he sees them as just another purse, just another wallet, just another source of coinage. Money. He doesn't know what's about to happen. And I wonder if Peter and John were just stepping off the cliff of miracle for the first time. Verse 6, the story continues. Peter said to him, I have no money at all, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I order you to get up and walk. Then he took him by his right hand, the hand that was up always looking for money. Because that's the only thing he knew. That's the only way he could, he could hope to live was by extending his right hand for a handout for the goodness and kindness of strangers or people who walked by him every day and had stopped seeing him. Peter takes a hold of that right hand and pulls him up. 
He takes him by his right hand and helps him up. And at once the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up. He stood on his feet. He started walking around. And he went into the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising the Lord. And I love this picture. This first miracle. This is, it begins with Jesus, with Jesus being proclaimed into this man's life. It begins with Peter and John and this man looking at each other and seeing each other for the first time, really seeing who is there. And then into the temple he dances. Could just, I, I, just, I just love that picture. It's like, I, mean, I, just, it's like, I couldn't walk with, ah, it's just, look, can you see what happened? It's like, and so people start to gather. He jumps up, jumping and praising God. The people there saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the beggar who sat at the beautiful gate that they were. And they were all surprised and amazed at what had happened to him. And as the men held on to Peter and John at Solomon's porch, as it was called, the people were amazed and ran to them. And when Peter saw the people, he said to them, and that's 20 verses what Peter said to them, and there's some good stuff in there. But what Peter does, what Peter does is he roots this moment, this healing, this dance in the temple back into the story of God's people, back into the stories that they knew and remembered and thought that they understood. Peter takes, powered by the Holy Spirit, Peter takes Jesus and ties it back into every piece of their history, into every bit of their, their understanding, their religious understanding. He ties it back, seeing, showing, here's Jesus, with an with a emphasis on, oh, by the way, every time God has come in and said that Jesus is coming, in all the many and various ways that he said that, there was always a sense, and so you need to repent that's woven into this story, this tapestry of Jesus cropping up all throughout the story. It leads to that very moment. Peter leads his listeners to that very moment of, of all that is about to happen, that the name of Jesus, and it's like, it's not us. The name of Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this grace, this love is coming into the world. And then to verse 26, And so God chose his servant Jesus and sent him to you first to bless you by making every one of you turn away from your wicked ways. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. It's the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, of Nazareth that brings this power. God's power in Jesus through the Holy Spirit pouring through God's people is in this world now. And it's easy for us 2,000 years later to go, well, that's, that's nice for them. Well, I don't see it happening today. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's not 3,000 people in here. That's you guys talking, not me. So yeah, it's all fine and good, preacher, for you to tell me that the Spirit is, is alive and at work in the church still today, and I'm telling you that. It's all very fine and good for you to do that, but I'm not seeing it. I believe, I really believe that God's power, God's Spirit that very same spirit that moved in the world at Pentecost, that very same spirit that inspired Peter, the very same spirit that, that brought 3,000 and then another 5,000 after this story happens into, into the, the believing world, that, that same spirit is at work in you. In you. I really believe that. And in the world around us. We struggled a little bit with, as we read this story at, at the deacons meeting this week about, okay, well, if that's true... How? Why? And we kind of came up with the notion that maybe, that maybe every time there is healing in the world today, and if that happens when you take an aspirin and your headache goes away, or you go to the surgeon and they fix your shoulder or your knee or your heart or your whatever part of your being, 
where you go to a therapist and pour out your, your fears and your doubts and your anguish. Or you're able to talk to a family member who you've been on the outs with for maybe decades or maybe just a couple of minutes. Whenever two people really see each other, really see each other, whenever there is healing in the world today, that is God at work. Do you think? You can disagree with me on that, and people will. And if you go out there and start telling people, hey, did you see that miracle? I just took an aspirin. People are going to think you're nuts. Okay, give them that. I don't care if they think you're nuts. I, I worry if they think I'm nuts, but they can. <laughs> but I'm willing to be out there saying every healing that takes place in the world today has got to work. Now, we'll have to talk about the healings that don't happen some other time in some other place. There's something else going on there. But anytime there is healing in the world today, however it takes, however it happens, I believe is the work of God. Anytime there is love, anytime there is love, anytime you love, whether it's your spouse or your grandkids or your wife's lasagna, anytime there is that, that, that total Ah, love in your life, that is God, the, the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Does that make sense? And again, people will think, no, I'm, I'm perfectly capable of doing this on my own. Bulk. And you'll run into the same thing with the healing. I mean, some people will say, oh, it's medical science, and we figured this stuff all out. Yeah, you, whose brain, who, where'd that brain come from? Who created that brain? The medical, the advances of medical science, the, the advances of, of science at all. That's God at work too going, I'll give you, I'll, I'm going to teach you a little bit. I'm going to teach you folks a little bit today. And he opens up some scientist's brain to reveal some new truth. Touches some doctor's hands, some new experimental procedure, shows some new chemical concoction that will make a tremendous difference in somebody's life. That's God at work. If we recognize it, what a difference. If we proclaim that this, all, this, all the good that there is in the world is God at work, how much better is our reputation and our witness and our love going to be out there in the world? And it's not you. It's not me. It is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that does anything in the world. Another piece of the story that's particular powerful for me is this call away from wickedness. And we talked a little bit about that last week. So last week, as Peter preaches, he's preaching out in the streets of Jerusalem. People. You know, they're, they're, in, they're into Jerusalem for, for, the, for the holiday. They're there, they're, and so, but so they're, they're sort of generally religious people. But they're, they hear this amazing, this amazing rush of God's power, and they hear this story, and, and Peter takes it to the people on the streets. Today's story, it's the gathering of, the, the, a more intense gathering of the faithful. They're in the worship place. They're in the temple. They're the people that you would expect would probably be the more religious, the more righteous, the more, you know, the, the really good folks that are there on, on Sunday morning, Saturday afternoon, you know, if you're Jewish. These are the religious. He, he's, he takes it a step deeper into the heart of God's people. Kind of a, amongst some people that you would think probably kind of maybe should be getting it already anyway. But this is where he comes with the message of you wicked people. What's that about? What is their wickedness if they're there in the worship place? If they're there pouring out their offerings? What does he think? What kind of wickedness are they up to? And it comes with the, with the reminder, with the accusation. Oh, by the way, that Jesus that we're talking about? <laughs> Talked about this last week. You killed him. It's your fault. 
It's one thing to say that out on the streets amongst the rabble, and we're going, crucify, crucify. It's another thing to take it right into the temple and go, oh, yeah, you people. It was you. He's dead. He's rose again. That's not what it's supposed to be, but you know the killing part? Yeah. That was you. It's interesting, though. Because if there's anything that, would, that, would, that would, you would think would condemn a people to H-E double hockey sticks forever, if there was anything that could get you in deep doo-doo for the rest of eternity, you would think it would be killing Jesus. Wouldn't you? But it's almost as if Peter and John don't care. Yeah, you did that. You were, you were ignorant about that, the story says. Let go of that wickedness. Whatever it was that caused that, just let it go, and you're saved. Kind of makes you wonder about all that stuff that we think is going to send people to H-E double hockey sticks all the time that we get all uptight about, and if killing Jesus isn't going to get you there, what will? These people are saved. I love this church. I love this church. I love this church. It begins here. This church begins in that grace, in that forgiveness. Is it because, the, is, does the reason Peter and John, and through, by the Holy Spirit, walk into the temple with this story, is it because God's people always, always, even today, need to be reminded, challenged, that God's people are not to be about maintaining an institution or a tradition or a practice or the law, but instead to be about bringing God's love to bear in real and powerful ways in the lives of real people. Then there or here now, if this or any religious practice fails to bring the love, that is the wickedness I put to you that we all need to be saved from. This place, this faith community faces the same challenge. Our mission to know Christ and to have others know him is designed to keep us on track, but keeping that mission as the reason, the impulse, the directing norm, that's what this time together is, is for. That's what this building is for. That's what the organizational detail is for. That's what the camera is for and the computers are for and the organ is for and the pews are for and the bathrooms even. That's what they're for, to bring love into God's people's lives, to bring lives into people, love into the lives of people who don't know that they are loved. All of it only and forever to bring God's love to focus in real and powerful ways in the lives of real people. If that's not happening, that's the wickedness I put to you. That's the challenging message. But it's the message that, burst the commun that bur gave birth to the community we are listening about in the book of Acts. And that message is going to get Peter and John into trouble. We'll see more about that next week. Because they take this challenge right into the very heart of the religious leadership. The ones who are charged with keeping God's people moving in the love of God and the love of each other. This message comes with an accusation that those religious leaders have once again failed miserably to proclaim. And they react poorly, as we shall see. But I pray not you or me. I pray that as we leave our time together today, it will be energized in love. Love God, love each other, seeing each other in love, every each other we see, everywhere we go. Because Jesus has lifted us. And I'm glad about that. So would you sing that song with me? I'm so glad Jesus lifted me.
Would you proclaim that faith together as you rise, as you are able? Together, the words of the Apostles' Creed, our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Take some time, share that peace, see each other today. We begin the process of gathering this morning's offering. Thank you very much for your ongoing prayerful and financial support of the work and ministry of our congregation. Along the lines of that thank you, you may have noticed on your way in this morning that there is a cake that will be part of our, part of our uh, coffee celebration this morning. That cake is in celebration of the success of the matching fund appeal. As you heard about this probably in previous weeks, but yes, we raised the $20,000 that kicked in another $20,000, and it's going to re- make sure that our work and ministry together moves forward. So have a piece of cake and celebrate that together this morning, and, and um ya ya even today. Ooh, yeah, indeed, yeah. That cake is an expression of our love. That's it's all. It's a, yeah, the cake is for love too. Um, if you may have noticed the mountain in the narthex as well, the Norwegian mountain for our vacation Bible school supplies. You can get to grab a snowball off of there and get the, that back by July 1st. We thank you for your support on that. There's also another little thing set up in the narthex this morning about God's work, our hands. Mary, you wanted to share a little bit about that today. Good morning. So we have an awesome opportunity to show God's work to real people out in our community with God's work, our hands. Now that's coming up. It's going to be on September 18th. And to a lot of us, September is like, ah, that's way out there. (laughs) But there's a fair amount of planning that has to take in advance of that. And so I'd like you to start thinking now about joining in on God's work, our hands. Once again, we're going to be doing this in conjunction with Zion Lutheran Church and with Queen of Peace. Uh, Last year, we had a total of about 250 uh, members from those three churches working out in the community on a Sunday, doing community service projects. 30 of those people came from our saviors. So I'm hoping that this year we can have a much uh, bigger showing from our church as well. Um, There's a variety of things that we do on God's Work Our Hands Day. Um, We work out in the community with people that have expressed a need. Sometimes it's washing windows, it's pruning brushes, uh, we've sealed driveways, we've pulled weeds. uh, A number of things that way for community members in need. We've served the, the city by helping to clean up trash in certain areas. And then there's also a couple of other places. If you're not physically one that wants to go out and do something like that, um, we do serve lunch, so we need people to help with serving lunch and cleaning up from lunch. And we also are going to have one of the fellowship halls set up to do 
um, service kits. So we will be maybe doing bandages for the Red Cross, making health kits and uh, baby kits for Lutheran World Relief, um, taking um, old flannel sheets and making them into baby receiving blankets, a little bit of sewing projects. So there's a number of things that can be done that can show our love out in the community. And I'm asking each of you to consider committing to being part of that. Um, one of the challenges is it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. I can't accept a project unless I know I've got volunteers who are going to do that project. And um, so I, I need people to sign up and let me know in advance that you're willing to be part of this. Um, so there's a sign-up sheet out there, um, and I would ask you to put down, if you have a, a preference for what you'd like to do, put that down. But if you could leave me your name and phone number and let you, me know that you would be, like to be part of this, I would appreciate it. The other thing is that there's another sign up out there for this lovely t-shirt, you know, golden. So there's a, for $8 each, we can have uh, God's Work Our Hands t-shirts. Uh, one of our volunteers last year wanted to work the early shift, so they went over to be part of Zion's uh, earlier service, and they walked into the back of church, looked around, turned around, came back over here and got their shirt because Zion was a sea of golden t-shirts, and they felt that they would stand out if they went in and they didn't have a, a golden t-shirt on. Um, so we'd love to see a sea of golden t-shirts here at Our Saviors as well, and the sign-up sheet is out there. T-shirts are $8 each. The order has to go in early... Um, in August in order to get those back in time to be here for September 18th. Um, so I would love to see a sea of golden t-shirts going out from our Savior showing that like the Acts of the Apostles, today's Apostles, we go out into our community and we show our love by doing things, by serving our community. So I'm asking you each to consider being part of that. Thank you. So, Mary, the uh, the T-shirts for eight dollars are customized with the uh, customized with our savings on the back. Well, that's worth seven dollars and fifty cents right there. So, that's, <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. In our prayers today, yes. In our prayers today, we'll be remembering Judy Wiles and her family. Her sister, Janice Arisman, passed away this week. Her funeral will be up at Grace Lutheran in Hermantown on Thursday at 11 o'clock, a visitation at 10. So we'll be keeping that family in our prayers. Also, Sonia Wick's two-year-old great-granddaughter died this past week. Uh, the services have already been held for, for her. Please support Sonia and her family in prayer as well. And continue to support the in your prayers, the family of Verna Norgren and her family and friends, whose memorial service we held here yesterday, the flowers and the banner remind us of, of, of her life and her faith. So keep them in your prayers this morning. Would you rise with me as uh, we bless the offering with our offering song, Let the Vineyards Be Fruitful. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the church, for those in need, and all of God's creation. Lord of the church, your spirit continues to work to bring growth to the communities who follow you. For that, we thank and praise you. Let us ever be aware of that spirit at work in our midst to direct and heal, to shape and grow, so that the world will continue to be amazed at the power of your love through your church of every expression, congregation, synod, churchwide, every denomination. Let that amazement bring ever more people to your son's service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord of healing. Your Spirit continues to offer healing, grace, hope, and strength to all who need it. For that, we thank and praise you. Help us to always truly see one another in our daily walk, even in our families as we move about in the world around us. Let us always be open to how your healing works, even in the face of the mystery of it. Let us be reminders of your wholeness for those who grieve, like Judy Wiles and her family, and Sonia Wick and her family, and the family of Vernon Norgren, and those affected by the mass shooting last night in Orlando. Let us be reminders and workers of your healing for all who are wounded, all who face illness or, or heartache, all who need healing of any sort, including those we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of creation, this is an amazing world, an amazing universe. For that, we thank and praise you. Help us be better caretakers of this awesome creation, eager learners of lessons of conservation and renewal, willing servants so that the abundance this world has de was designed to provide for all people and animals and life will be restored and refreshed. Help us to be eager responders when the imbalance creates disaster. Help us to be there when the mysteries of creation create heartache and, and pain in the lives of all your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting your promise to hear us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare to hear the words of institution and give thanks to God for the Holy Supper, let's join together in singing a communion song, Come, Let Us Eat. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The grapes are offered to the youngest members of our assembly as a reminder of this same story, this same grace, this same love to the youngest among us. Together, may we receive these blessings and prepare our hearts as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ invites you to a place of honor at this banquet. Welcome to the feast. You may be seated. You are all welcome here, Lutheran or not, member or not. You are all welcome and encouraged to come to the Lord's table. We'll be serving at two stations. This morning you'll be invited to come from the wings first down the center aisle. If you'd like to remember your baptism at the font, you please do so. If you'd like to stop after you've received the elements and pray at the rail, you're welcome to do that as well. If you cannot come forward, the first team finished will serve you as soon as we can. You are all welcome.
Do you rise with me for the blessing? May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in God's grace, love, and compassion now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. O God, as a mother comforts her child, so you comfort your people, carrying us in your arms and satisfying us with this food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Send us now as your disciples, announcing peace and proclaiming that the reign of God has come near. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. O God of tender compassion, as you heal the sick and welcome the stranger, bless those who leave this assembly to share the gifts of this table with our sisters and brothers who cannot be with us today. May they be sustained by the love and prayers of this community, by the bread of life that satisfies all hunger. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and grace and give us peace. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.